right, well, hey, everybody. Good afternoon. I think it's afternoon now. Uh, Raji, it's great to, great to be here with you again. Always great to be here. So, you know, um, as we just heard, you know, obviously it's been a big year for Sprinkler. Uh, you went public in, in June and I, I covered the IPO and, and uh, it's just been interesting to see the growth of the company over the last, especially the last five years, there's been a lot of momentum. Um, what is this year, let's start with that, like if we were to, before getting into the weeds on things, this moment in time for Sprinkler, this summer IPO, high market cap, everything like that, um, what has that meant for you as a founder but also as, for Sprinkler as a company? Well, I get to meet uh, a lot of interesting and fascinating people, and I get to tell the story of Sprinkler and what we are trying to do over and over again. And I get to listen to them, give me feedback, and watch their reactions and refine our story. So I think that's been the biggest lesson for me, to, to get our story refined um, and be able to say that in a way that more people understand it and can take advantage of it. Yeah, so for, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience know Sprinkler, uh, either they are customers or they've heard about them through different categories, but for those who maybe aren't familiar, could you just give a little more context to when and why the company is founded and what you guys do? So I did a, a few startups before Sprinkler and they were in email marketing. And, and so when in, you know, 2009, 2008, you know, social media was just growing like crazy, Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. And what I saw was basically the next evolved way to communicate at scale without any of the problems we had in email marketing. So it was obvious to me that businesses are gonna need a way to communicate on these channels. And that's where we got the idea of uh, Sprinkler. We got started um, in, in my spare bedroom. Wow, yeah, it's come a long way since then, yeah. Come a long way since then. <laughs> well, it's interesting thinking about, you know, the title of this talk, uh, you know, being a unifier, right? You know, and something uh, both within companies and customers, and there's been a lot of discussion, especially the last couple of years around uh, how do brands interact with customers and how do they track what customers like and don't like and what do they need. And so, um, well, let's zoom in on Sprinkler in a second, but if you were to just kind of give a bit more of a lay of the land where you're thinking about, um, you know, the category that Sprinkler sits in and just the importance of, of SaaS companies right now and, and why there's a need for uh, companies to be tracking all this data because I feel like that's something that's been relevant for years but it seems like it's come to a head a bit this past couple of years. Before we think about what brands are doing, let's think about our life as consumers. If you um, get off a plane and you had a bad, tough flight like many of us do and you tweet worst flight ever, it would be very awkward to then step out and get a survey from United or whoever saying, how was your flight? I just <laughs> told seven billion people that. And it's also frustrating when you get into the Uber and the driver's going, how was your flight? I'm like, how many times do I have to repeat it? Then you show up at the hotel in the lobby and there are six other people like, looking at your bag going, did you have a good flight? No, I did not, and I told everyone that. <laughs> Instead, if they had the ability to listen to conversations that are relevant, be able to relate it to the experiences they can provide as a brand, as an airline, or as a, a hospitality, or the hotel, or as a transportation company, and then if you're able to work across your silos to do that, because sometimes you can listen, but you can't act. Because as a consumer, if you think you have a problem with your Xbox controller and you call or email someone, you think you're talking to Microsoft, okay? How many business units do you think Microsoft has between you know, your, their, their apps and Azure and, and Office 365 and hardware? You think about, let's say they got 50 different business units, many of them are billion dollar companies. You think about every one of those business units operating in somewhere between 20 and 75 to 100 countries. In each country, they're trying to market to you, they're trying to do customer care, they're trying to advertise. In each country, for each business unit, they are in marketing, they're trying to do that across email and phone and web and you think about every one of those systems hoarding data. And so when you talk to a customer service team, 
in London, th that data sits in that system and it's not shared with anybody else. So as a result, they can't see you as a human being mm -hmm. while you see a large company as a brand and that's a huge problem. So the whole idea of unification is how do we allow a company to care for you, engage with you, reach you, and you know, advertise to you across channels for each business unit, across all markets, so that when you talk to Microsoft, Microsoft can talk to you. Yeah, well, that's a good distinction, because thinking about you know, a brand as is, is being uh, a company that's one to many, right? And then, you know, the examples you just laid out, it's many, it's, it's thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of, of to one. And there's this interesting disconnect between what somebody thinks a brand is, mm -hmm. uh, name whatever brand you want, and the reality of, of you know, it's funny, like uh, you, you use the example of a flight. I had a, a almost emergency even getting my flight here. I couldn't get someone on the phone for an hour and a half, mm -hmm. you know, and there was no way of getting a hold of anybody. And so it's interesting thinking about that and, Never had a problem like that on an airline before. But what, what are you seeing when you're thinking about the way that consumers interact with brands and how that changes their view of the company that they interact with? Because when you're tracking everything across these different platforms, whether it's Twitter, even you know, some people might publicly complain about it, others might not. Um, how has that shaped the way that companies, whether it's clients or, or sprinkle yourself, um, thinks about the weight of consumer sentiment. Because I know that you guys are doing a lot around uh, natural language processing and just the role of AI to be able to measure what people are thinking about any given brand. Well, it's not even the consumer sentiment. It's basics of having a conversation. If I'm talking to you and I'm not watching what you say to me or answering anything you ask me, but I keep speaking, it's gonna be a very awkward one-sided yeah. conversation. <laughs> Brands and companies now have to talk to all of us. And a 60% or 70% of that conversation need to be based on what we are saying to them. And if you think about the data that is publicly available, that is your voice, what you're saying that you like or don't like about a brand or about a product or about something that you do, and how valuable is that to anybody? So let's take an example. You think about Nike as a brand, global brand, right? Or any, anybody else, Adidas, Puma. You know, step one is for them to start listening to people mentioning at Nike. That's great. Step two is to say, what are they saying to my competitor? So what are they saying to Adidas? It's publicly available. Step three is where the magic happens when you are not just listening to what they're saying to you or your competitors, but you're listening to what people are talking about running or playing basketball or playing tennis. And almost every business decision you make should be, can be, and should be based on that data. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another example of you guys know about this company called Grab in, in Asia? It's, a, it's Uber. Yeah, it's a ratchet, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. And they came to our conference and they were saying how most of their strategic decisions are, maze, are based on the voice of the customer through Sprinkler, but you know, that we're just empowering and enabling them. So they had, when COVID hit, they found out that their drivers were not picking up passengers from, airport, uh, from hospitals hmm. or taking them to hospitals. So what they did was they created a, a new product with drivers who were willing to take the risk with taxis or cars that, were, that had extra protection with a increased fare to go back and forth from hospitals. Hmm. So that, that's something that they saw happen that's something that they could act, change their business on. And so many examples, they had electric scooters for their delivery uh, employees. And they found out that through social media and through public digital data, they found out that these employees would leave these electric scooters at home. And their little kids will take the scooters on the road and were getting into accidents. Wow. So they discontinued a product. 
Hmm. So that voice of the customer is very powerful in aggregate because your next product, what you need to fix, should I fix the restaurant or should I fix the swimming pool if I'm running a hotel? That decision should be based on your voice mapped to revenue. Yeah, well it's interesting because, so those are some, you know, obviously very relevant and new use cases, right, of, of how people are able to track everything. But I think just thinking uh, some lessons maybe that you've learned for maybe the other founders and, and other uh, people in, in the audience that are maybe thinking about their own evolution of a business. Maybe it's not uh, in quite in the same category, but you, you guys started off just, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, if I remember right, it's tracking social media sentiment and stuff like that, but you guys have expanded a lot beyond then to, you know, all of the customer experience. So when you're thinking about the growth of Sprinkler and what people need, what clients need versus what you maybe had at the time, um, how have you made those decisions when you're thinking about maybe new markets to go into, new technologies to develop? Uh, how do you prioritize? And, and we just will love, I don't know if there are any examples of maybe kind of uh, inflection points in the business over time. So I think clarity of ideas are very, very important. And, and not in terms of solution, but in terms of the problems that you solve. And when I started Sprinkler in, in 2009, I went to TwitterCon, which was a Twitter conference at that time. And I literally chased the person who was at Dell at that time, Dell Computers was doing social media for them. Mm. And I went and asked her, Steph, what are the things that you wish you could do today with social that you are not able to because you don't have technology? And she just rattled off a whole bunch of things. I took notes. Two months later, I called her and said, hey, can you just look at what we built and see whether it works for you? So that's where we started. That's where we got the idea clarity. And then it kept evolving against this broader concept of how do we enable and empower organizations to reach, to engage, and to listen to customers on all these channels. Um, and the way to get that right, invariably, guys, the way to get that right, invariably, is to listen to your customers in a very unfiltered way. So every time I feel like I need guidance, I make 100, 200, 300 customer calls. It's interesting, yeah. It seems like listening, obviously, is a very key piece of that. Are there? It is. <laughs> yeah, which feels very, um, I feel like saying the word meta these days means something else. <laughs> but it feels very meta almost thinking about listening, you as a founder, to the customers versus listening to customers on behalf of these other customers. And so, um, but are there, are there, is there an example of maybe um, time that you maybe had to be a bit contrarian to what customers were wanting? You know, you think of the classic example of Apple want, knowing what, customers want before they do, you know? Are there examples of that that maybe you thought, hey, customers want, customers want this, but based on the feedback I'm getting across the board, we actually think they need this. Mm. So um, I, the, the Steve Jobs example has been used so many yeah. times. The truth is even with Sprinkler, we, we, we're building something that everybody's gonna need, mm -hmm. right? It's just a question of time, but you're gonna need what we're building. Um, however, We've been at it now for 12 years and the market's barely beginning to understand it, which is why we took the company public so we could have a platform to say the message. Let me give you an analogy on how to think about listening to customers versus knowing what you need for them. At least in the case of Sprinkler, the way we think about what we want to build, which is a unified platform for all customer facing functions and activities, that is like your GPS in your computer. You put the address, you don't go, tell me where I should go. Yeah. <laughs> so you put your home address, your work address, a hotel, like wherever you want to go, you punch that in. But should you make the next left turn or a right turn? Should you go through the highway or take an exit and cut through? let that be decided by your customers. Mm. So your vision is something that you've got to fight for if you believe that you're gonna solve a problem that the market is not ready for. But how you get there should be guided by your customers. And I, I find a lot of companies trying to just impose a product that's not ready on a market and fail. Mm. And I also see a lot of companies who keep pivoting because their customers say, oh, I want this. 
but then they say they want that, and they just go whiplash. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that could get confusing both to a customer, but also to a, a, a founder thinking, you know, what direction to really go. Um, you know, what is, when you're thinking about maybe what you're hearing about now from your customers, obviously you have a lot more customers than you had when you first started, uh, clearly, but what is it that people are wanting most now? What are those unsolved problems that you're hearing about maybe that you're working to solve, or maybe it's something that it's kind of outside of Sprinkler's remit that is also still really interesting when thinking about the broader issues that marketers face. Well, there are three distinct problems that Sprinkler solves for our customers. Um, one is there's a lot more channels and ways to connect with your customers now. So we give you the ability to talk to your customers wherever they are. So we support 36 channels, we just added voice. Mm -hmm. So we allow you to be where your customers are. So there's proliferation of channels and we allow you to be where your customers are. The second thing is on these channels, the newer digital social messaging channels, your customers and your prospects for the first time are putting out so much information about themselves willingly. We call it the third data store. Your first data store is your CRM system. Your second data store is your CDP, behavioral system. Your third data store is Sprinkler, your CXM database, which probably has 10,000 times more data than your CRM system. So the second problem that we solve for you is we bring this data for you and we help you understand what people are saying in a way that you can act on it. So we can give you that one-star review and we can tell you, hey, route this to customer care and open up a ticket. We can also tell you your number one issue is packaging on this product in this market. The third problem we solve for customers is we help them deal with a customer whose expectations have changed. You and I, and none of us, are like the customers anyone had 20 years ago. Because I don't think I can be on the phone for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I used to be able to be on the phone hold for an hour. I can't do it anymore. We're I impatient. <laughs> yeah, I definitely didn't want to be. <laughs> yeah, and we don't, we don't buy anything without reading a review. So we're very changed, our expectations have changed. And the only way to meet a customer who is in control and has different higher expectation is to, expectations is to work across all your silos internally and by unifying the front office. So those are the three things. Be where your customers are, understand what matters to them, and then have next generation capabilities to market and advertise and do customer care on a unified platform that allows you to be seamless when you're dealing with the customer. Sure. So. You know, there are a number of follow-up questions I could you know, ask to keep going down that road, but you know, we only have a minute left here. So one of the things that stuck out to me this summer, going back full circle to the IPO, was you know, the last 10 years has seen so much consolidation in the ad tech, martech space, either M&A or, or whatever else. And, um, but you guys never sold. You know, even when a lot of competitors did. So uh, for any founders out there that are also wondering if they should sell or how do they decide or how do they take money, what advice would you maybe end on today when you're thinking about uh, whether to sell or not? It depends on what you're trying to do and how convinced you are about what you think you're building for the world and the need that the world has for it. Um, if you have that conviction, you should take it all the way. If you don't, you're building it to, to sell, you should sell. It's, I don't think there's a generic answer, but I think what I would lead with is be very clear on what is it that you're building, how it creates value, and ask yourself what is it that you are trying to do. Great, well, Raji, thank you for being here, and thanks everyone for listening.